Hey everyone, today we are doing a gameplay overview and review. Oh, I screwed that up, sorry. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to another episode with To Die For Games. I'm Mandy, also known as the Board Gaming Pinup Girl. And I'm Carol, also known as Carol Has No Tan. And today we're doing a gameplay overview and review of the game Quests of Valeria. So, looking forward to this one. Yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Very <laughs> that all the time. <laughs> so before we get to the game, we got to take a look at some of the business. So, we have timestamps below. There's a place you really want to get to. And if you have questions or comments, please leave them below. So I think we're ready to take a look at Quests of Valeria. <laughs> First, we have the citizen cards. Next, we have the card cost tokens. Here we have the quests. Then we have the guild master cards, followed by the player aids, which are double sided. The player action tokens, marked one and two. And the first player token. First, you want to hand each player a guild master card. These cards will let you know the type of quests that if you achieve them, you will get bonus points at the end of the game. Those are kept secret. Next, the card cost tokens are placed down in the tavern line. That would be this area here. Shuffle the citizen deck and give each player three cards. Then six cards are taken from the citizen deck and placed under the card cost token, and you'll see they're increasing in cost. Next, you wanna shuffle the quest deck and flip six into the display or in the tavern. With two players, it would only be four. These are placed just above the tavern line. Next, you determine first player and however you choose and provide them with the first player token. And with the two, action tokens. And if you're like me, a little forgetful, give everyone their player aid. You do not have any cards here yet. These will be in hand, but cards that are placed here in your tableau or guild as they will be referred to throughout the game. Throughout the game, you'll see different symbols on the citizen cards and quest cards, so we'll go through them. So in this card here, you'll see in the upper right, these are the citizen rules. We'll go through the four that exist in the game. This one here, is the shadow. The next is the soldier. The following is the worker. And finally, we have holy. Now you'll also see some other symbols here. Now these here are the different types of resources in the game. They include magic, strength, and gold. There are other symbols on the citizen cards, and these are just a couple that you may see. So in this case here, at the bottom, in order to take this action, you will be required to discard a citizen card from your guild or tableau, and, or your hand, in order to draw two cards. So this arrow in this direction is requiring a payment of sorts before you can take the action. Another example would be this card here, which is fairly simple. It lets you either take the draw or higher action when you acquire this card. So there are several actions that you can take on your turn. You can either draw, hire, reserve, or complete a quest. So on the first player's turn, or on a player's turn, they will have their first player token and their action markers. This is great to keep track of how many turns you are taking because you are allowed two actions on your turn. So first for the draw action, I could decide to, in hand, have these cards, but then I can decide to draw a card from the citizen deck. By drawing a card, it would come to my hand and I would pass this token to the next player to simulate that I have already completed thy first action. Another action you can do is to hire. To hire, you can do this a couple of ways. The first way is to discard cards from your hand in order to obtain a card down here. So another citizen card that you would like to bring into your guild or tableau. Why do you want to come take these cards? These are gonna help you complete your quest. So, like me, I usually try and go for the ones that are low cost, and I generally tend to go for the zero, and I would place that in my tableau. By doing so, I am now able to take the action 
that's on the bottom of the card. In this case, it has the D, which, symbols, which symbolizes to draw a card. So by doing that, place that in my tableau or my guild, and then I would now draw a card which goes to my hand. If I chose to do a card that had a cost, I would have to discard a card from my hand in order to pay for it. So for example, if I decided I wanted the mercenary, it also has a draw bonus, but it costs two. So I put that here into my tableau or guild, and I would then have to look through my hand and decide, oh, which two cards am I discarding to pay for this card? Now finally, you can also decide to hire a citizen card from your hand. This is a little bit different because you now have to discard two cards in order to place one, so it can be very expensive. So if I wanted to place the Paladin, for example, which actually has no bonuses, and I'd like to place that in my guild, I would have to then discard two cards from my hand to the discard citizen pile. The next action you can complete is to reserve. So this is reserving a quest, and this is kind of neat. So you basically are trying to, you would like to take one of the quests available. So if it's on my turn as my second action, I can pass it to the next player, and I can decide to take one of the quests available. Keep in mind, it's probably a good idea to try and pick one that's in line with your Guildmaster card. So for me, I'm looking for commerce or battle quests. So I can see right here, we've got a few. Battle quests looks pretty darn good. So looking at the card, you're trying to figure out how to complete it. This is the type of card. The icons you'll see on the card will be listed here. And those are required in, to be in your tableau in order to complete this quest. So if I decide to take this quest, you notice it doesn't refill. So anytime cards are taken from here or here, they don't refill till the end of the player's turn. So my quest will stay out visible. So this tells me that I don't quite have enough to finish it because I need six strength, which I do not have. I only have one listed on my card. So I'll need to acquire more cards in my tableau in order to complete this quest. Completing a quest costs an action. So in this case, I would not be able to complete it even if I did have the cards until the following turn. Another option with quests is this, you can decide you don't like any of the ones here and you can choose to discard all quests and draw six new ones. Once you've drawn six new ones, you can then decide which quest you'd like to choose from the one that are, that are available. Keep in mind that as soon as you complete a quest, which we'll talk about later, there are rewards. Something important to note, your hand limit is eight, while your guild or tableau is also eight. Quests are not part of that limit. Finally, the last action is to complete a quest. First, I look at the quest I have here, and it shows me a few different icons as we discussed earlier. Here I have the icon that shows a soldier. Then I also need three strength. So I look at my tableau to see if I have the following. So looking at my tableau, I have one soldier on this card here. I also have one strength. I also have another strength on this card and another on this card. So I've had to use all of my cards to complete it, but I have completed that quest. As soon as that happens, you're able to take the rewards that are listed on the bottom portion of the quest card. So in this case, I would get one victory point at the end of the game, and this allows me to complete another quest if I had one available. Once completed, you would turn it upside down. I like to keep them under my quest card, sorry, under my guild master card for safekeeping. At the end of the round, if there are any open spaces, they would then be filled back here or in the market. These would be actually, if there was nothing here, these would actually be shifted down so they become less expensive. And a new one is drawn in the more expensive area. So if you wait long enough, you might get the card you want at a lesser price. The end of the game is triggered when a player has completed five quests. Players continue to take turns in the turn order until it reaches the first player, so they're equal number of turns. Then you would count all your victory points that you have from any quests you've completed, in addition to bonus points from your guild master. The player with the most points wins the game. So Carol, over to you, what'd you think? 
I like what it's trying to do. Okay. But, oh boy. Yeah, I think you'll agree with me. Okay. Rule book was very confusing. <laughs> we spent more than 30 minutes, almost an hour, trying to figure out how to play the game. Yeah. I, I thought for me, there were parts of the rule book that I just, I just didn't like the wording and that could have just been a me thing. And the iconography was killing me. I don't know if it was just, uh, I don't know. I found the iconography a bit confusing. And I don't know if that's a rule book thing or it's just the iconography thing, but. Yeah, like, and I guess they're trying to do like these very small size travel box games that are, you know, kind of called backs to other games. Like for example, this one's calling back to Race for the Galaxy. Right. But because the rule book is small and they're trying to make it very condensed, there is a lack of diagrams in it. And yes. they keep referring to things in certain terms, like this is your guild, and this is this, this is this. And then it's it's like, okay, so is my guild what's in front of me? Or is that what's yeah. in my hand? And that's the part that confused me the most, because there's no diagram kind of like naming it exactly for you. It's literally, you know, part, part of the vocabulary and, and like the passages telling you what's what. And it's a little hard to, to kind of remember that, honestly, when everything's like a block of text. It did, in the book, I did notice this, it did go switch between Tableau and Guild. And that yes. can be confusing if you're trying to teach somebody or you're trying to learn it and you're like, okay, well, which one is it? Do you know what I mean? And I get it and I know now what they mean, but yes, it's better to stay consistent so you're not confusing people. Yeah, You know, exactly. now it just comes up as a new term and you're like, wait, is that what we just learned or is that something new that you're introducing? So I get that part. Like, and I do like diagrams or pictures. Uh, in a rule book, and I get it, not every rule book is big enough to, to hold all of that, but this book would benefit from that. Absolutely. But I will say, once we figure it out how to play the game after the rule book, I did like it. It took me about <laughs> halfway through the game to be like, oh, okay. I get it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm supposed to do this and I get this. Yeah. <laughs> and after that, I wanted to play again, not only because I finally understood it and I wanted right. to figure it out, but also because I actually liked it. It is yeah. a lighter version of Race for the Galaxy with a theme that I personally enjoy more, like the fantasy guild hiring people doing the quests. See, um, that re it reminded me of Lords of Waterdeep. Oh! It's Lords of Waterdeep. <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> I was like, oh, she means the other one. <laughs> I do mean the other one. I'm sorry. We're reviewing another one that's like Race for the Galaxy. I can use it for this one. That's Oops. the next one. That's the next <laughs> one area. The other town over. With another so, village over. So I'm, I'm going to go back and edit this. And every time I say that's Race for the Galaxy, I'm just going to like record over it and just say, <laughs> Lords of Waterdeep. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see it. You'll see it in the editing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Okay. So, Lords of Water Deep. Instead of your worker, you're paying for things with uh, a card cost. Oh, yeah, it is like Race for the Galaxy a little bit, where you're paying for things with a card cost. Okay, well, yeah, no, you could totally yeah. use that as an example. That's fine. And then give somebody <laughs> a reference. I just wasn't sure because I'm like, I think Lords of Water Deep is, I guess, would be the, well, the closest. But no, you're right. That totally could work. Yeah. Yeah. That's the answer I'm going to go with. <laughs> right. I, I think that's good. <laughs> but I do think Lords of Waterdeep because you have like your quests and you have like your, I don't know, in the Lords of Waterdeep, it's your Lord, right? And you're trying to get quests that are the same type as your Lord to get victory points at the end of the game. So, I mean, that was exactly the same in my opinion. You know, the tableau or of, um, of quests available to obtain. It's the same sort of concept as in Lords of Waterdeep. So, I mean, there was a lot of that. I mean, now, did it have as many action spaces on a board? Well, no, but I think it's supposed to kind of be a play off of Lords of Waterdeep. Uh, so it gives you that feeling. Yeah, it's basically a card version of Lords of Waterdeep. And I found it most interesting that the resources are all on the cards. It, it's not like anything physical or anything, like, or tokens or anything. So it's all purely just the tableau in front of you and the um let's call them not the marketplace but um uh, i know there's a name and i can't remember what it's called i know i feel like the tavern that's a, yeah i think it is like yeah. the tavern the tavern line i think it was called yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah yeah exactly so i liked i like that part and mm -hmm. it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a mind 
twist because you know you have things in your hand and then you have things on your tableau and then you have to pay with what's in your tableau and the things in your hand you have to still pay yeah. for and like there there's a little bit of chaining too which i was very bad at but i liked it so you know what that reminds me of because i just did that uh, podcast not too long ago yeah and the game tom was like oh no <laughs> oh my goods. Oh my goods. That is literally I didn't say that yet. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> so I but it's, <laughs> it's the same kind of like chain building. The cards can be used for multiple uses. You can build them, you can use them to pay with resources. Like it has a whole bunch of different ways. Like literally what you just described was oh my goods. <laughs> but in a smaller box in Quest of Valeria. Yeah, well, exactly, in a small box. So, And that's what I like about this game. Like, It gives you that Lords of Waterdeep feel, but in a small box, and it takes a shorter amount of time. I played mm -hmm. it with a couple, like a few different player counts, like two player, three player, even more like higher player count. It takes a bit longer, but if you get people who know the gist of Lords of Waterdeep, they'll understand this game, and I find it plays pretty quickly. Like, we taught someone new, and she mm -hmm. caught on fairly well, I thought, and she <laughs> won. And she beat us by two <laughs> points. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that goes to show that it's definitely, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not approachable. It's, uh, ah, the word's escaping me. Accessible. Accessible. Thank you. So I think that's a, that's a good thing and it's travel. I mean, it's travel size. And the art. How do we not talk about the art? Oh, I was getting to that. I was building oh, up to that. I will to that. <laughs> well, so, uh, the Miko, as his nickname is, he, right. he's uh, done the art for the other Valeria games, like Valeria Card Kingdoms, Villages of Valeria, as well as um, City of Spies, Estoril 1942. <laughs> and that. yeah, that sounds about right. And I really enjoy his art and it, it, it fits the theme and everything. It's kind of got like that bit of a grit to it. And it's like very, you know, like the, the brush strokes are just so loose and like they have a great feel to it. Like when you see a barbarian, he's got like, you know, like a this kind of expression. <laughs> and then you just know like, yeah, this guy's a barbarian, right? Yeah, yeah, it, exactly. It the theme very well. And I love his art style. Yeah, you know, it's good. And that's it. Like, it's very distinct. You can tell that he's done it. I mean, he does slight changes to it to fit the game, but you can definitely tell, yeah, that's Miko. I know that art. And it's always very well done. So I think in this case, art was really good. Uh, card wise, again, I don't think they were overly thick, the card stock on these. I don't know. I have a thing with cards. I like thick cards. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm just really spoiled because I've been playing with plastic cards in some games. So <laughs> I could be pushing it out there. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, I got to give some allowances. It is a smaller print game, but mm -hmm. I did find that could have been a little bit thicker, but that's just my opinion. Sure. But uh, I mean, other than that, it's card. So if you're going to focus on something, that should be really, really good, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah, and one thing. Yeah, sorry. Um, one thing that Daily Magic always does is their cardboard chits are extremely thick. I don't know if you remember, but it's like I do three layers of you know regular punch board, and then that's yeah. their, their chit. And it's it's strangely thick, but satisfying. Like it's nice to have something you know like that you're not gonna lose like that as easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it totally does. It reminded yeah. me of like a, a quadropolis type like thickness, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. Which is what you want, quality. So exactly. <laughs> so I don't think we talk, need to talk about comparable, comparable games because we did mention Lords of Waterdeep, Race for the Galaxy. So those are some, if you like those types of games, you will probably like this. I, I mean, overall, I liked this game. Uh, it did remind me of Lords of Waterdeep, which is one of my favorite games. So I like the fact that it was like travel size, compact, short amount of time. Those things appeal to me and I could, you know, carry it with me and play it and bring it out of a convention or something and it would work. So that to me was a big, like, I like that. Mm -hmm. Like for what it does, even though it's clearly inspired by Lords of Waterdeep, I think it can stand on its own. Like there's enough there for me to want to play it instead of Lords of Waterdeep, for example. And I don't want to bring out such a huge board and I just want to play with a really small tableau, play with two or three people. Like, yeah. even like you know, as I'm traveling, like it, it's completely a viable option. Exactly. I don't. I do think though. I mean, playtime will alter if you have someone who takes a long time, which I don't think. I mean, your decisions are fairly simple. You only have a few decisions. Are you hiring? Are you completing a quest? Are you taking a quest? I mean, the only thing that I had an issue was with the iconography. That took a while. I had to keep referring to the book because to me it was not intuitive. I couldn't tell just by looking at it. Okay, this does this. 
there were a few of them like the arrow going this way and this way and listen my memory is so short i need something to remind me so it was good they had the little player aid cards which were double-sided and that was fine but the iconography was a killer for me yeah absolutely but anything with iconography like once you once it clicks and once you recognize it it goes by right. so much faster and it's always the first or second playthrough where it's a little bit slower yeah, this is about three players. <laughs> I'm still yeah. like, eh. so I mean, for me, but that's just me. If it's not like initially intuitive, then yeah, it takes me a bit of time to kind of remember. But um, you're right. Within like, maybe if I played it six or seven times, I would probably get used to it. So like, that's just to be prepared. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But honestly, for a small game, six or seven times to play it to kind of really get it and just play it fast is a little bit too much for a small game. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. So, but overall, I like, like I actually really enjoyed it. And I, it's one of those games I would definitely play again and, you know, bring to a con or something like that. And, you know, easy enough to pick up. Like, I definitely think you could play it with, you know, if you had kids, I mean, not super young kids, but I think of an age where they, you know, they're in the like, I think like eight or nine. Do you think they could pick that up? They probably can, as long as someone can explain it and read the rule book, because that, like, as an adult, which is, oh, I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> and rule books are everything, right? It makes or breaks your game. Absolutely. Yeah. So overall, I like this one. This is like, Yahoo! <laughs> <laughs> I like this one too. I just wish the rule book was better. Yeah, that's, you know, something that can be fixed. So we hope. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our review for Quest of Valeria and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.